goodbye, Mr. Wilson. You understand, I'm sure, it wouldn't be right for a Member of Parliament to try to influence a local housing committee. Uh, go and see your local people. I'm sure you'll find them sympathetic. And now there are many more houses about, your chances are much better of getting a move. Well, thanks very much. That's the kind of case the constituent brings to his MP nowadays. Uh, he's got a council house, but it's too big for him, which means he's paying more rent than he needs. The local authority are willing to move him, but he likes the neighborhood. And he thinks I could do something to get him a smaller house at a cheaper rent on the same council estate. It's a sign of the times. People are getting choosy again. And that's because there is more of most things about, and therefore greater freedom of choice. You'll agree that's a good thing, and quite a change, too, from a few years ago. The strange thing is how quickly people forget. I'm always being astonished by the things people say to me on these Saturdays in my constituency office. The trouble is there's far too much pork in the shops. The price of coal is a scandal. We ought to grow more food in the colonies and bring the prices down. There's a series of remarks which proves what short memories people have got. Perhaps I have a long one. I remember when we were short of meat of all kinds. Then the complaint was not that we had too much of one kind, but we hadn't enough of any kind. You took your pork, or you mutton, or corned beef, without question, because it was all you could get. Some people were even glad to eat whale meat or snook. Now the Conservative government has restored freedom of choice, and the public has recognized the fact. I also remember how the socialists jeered at Lord Walton, because he said, what the nation needs is more red meat. Well, there's been more red meat. Quite a lot more than in the last year of the socialist government. So besides freedom of choice in quality, there's been more meat in quantity. Now let's talk about curl. I admit the price is high. I'm not here to defend the curl board. It's a nationalized industry. And we have to rely now on the minor sense of service to the community to produce enough curl so that there may be sufficient for all purposes. It is very important that there should be big enough stocks of curl to keep us going in an emergency. You remember as well as I do what happened in the winter of 1947. The socialist government, the great planners, hadn't seen to it that stocks of curl were sufficient. When the sudden freeze-up started, the coal wasn't there. On the ice-bound roads, what coal there was couldn't be distributed. People in their homes shivered and suffered. But worst of all, industry without coal ran down. And nearly two million workers became unemployed. That was a national experience which should be burned into our memories. The price of coal has had to go up with miners' wages. But under a conservative government, you'll not find chances taken with the essential stocks on which we rely to keep the wheels of industry turning. We ought to grow more food in the colonies and keep the prices down. I must say, I've got a lot of sympathy with that one. But it must not be done by grandiose backroom planning inspired by optimism and multiplication tables. And we must see that every encouragement is given to agriculture at home uh, to produce as much food as possible. The fate of the groundnut scheme should warn us against the danger of rushing in with ill-thought-out schemes and of the state attempting to do what is much best left to those with business experience. While the groundnut scheme uh, was the most famous failure of the socialist government's colonial enterprises, there were others. The magnificent plan to cultivate a vast area of Queensland with sorghum has been wound up. Wonderful on paper, but the rain wouldn't fall to order. Isn't it strange that then, in the socialist government's time, so many people believed in these golden dreams of vast harvests 
to fatten thousands of pigs for British breakfast tables. We've come so far back on the road to sound principles that the things that happened under socialism seem to belong to a remote age. Taxation, direct and indirect, going up. Rationing with queues at the shops. Goods made for export only. Cost of living always on the rise. Houses. No hope of getting a house without waiting for years. Frequent power cuts and financial crises. Always a financial crisis in the offing. And it's not so long ago that they landed us in their last crisis. At the time of the 1951 election, we were facing bankruptcy. And when the voters went to the poll, they were literally casting their votes for financial ruin or a chance of salvation. The Conservative government on taking office found a terrible state of affairs with our reserves draining away at a rate which would have bankrupted us within a year. And don't forget that bankruptcy would have meant unemployment and hunger on an unprecedented scale. We know now that Mr. Churchill's government applied the right remedies for the immediate crisis. But even more important, they did it in a way that provided the basis for our whole future recovery. The Conservative government stopped the rot by doing a lot of unpopular things. And Mr. Butler, in his first budget, put the long-term policy into operation by putting back incentive into work. At the same time, he adjusted the social benefits in such a way that they went to those who really needed them. A chap came to me the other Saturday with a lot of complaints. I said to him, tell me honestly, were you better off then, before the change of government, or now? He said, well, of course, I'm an exception. I don't pay income tax now, and if I want to work overtime, I can earn a quid or two before they take some of it away. I said, you're not an exception. If you look out of that window, most of the people you see in the street are than they were in 1950. Two million have ceased to pay income tax altogether. Fifteen million others in that first budget found their income tax less. Practically no overtime earnings nowadays carries the full rate of tax. In 1953, 16 and a half million people got their tax cut by sixpence. And if we include their dependents, no less than 30 million people were affected. Purchase tax, which affects everyone, was cut by a quarter. And among the people in the street are those whom the Conservative government helps by raising their pensions, benefits or allowances to cope with the cost of living, which, never forget, has been levelling off under the Conservatives. The big rise took place in the Socialists' last year of office, when it rose 12%. Let me take you into the homes of some of these people whom we have helped. The pensioner. His retirement pension went up, in some cases half a crown a week, in others six and sixpence, and his wife's in proportion. The widow's benefit was increased. If she had a child to look after, the increase was three shillings a week. An elderly widow on pension got an increase of six and sixpence. Sickness benefit and unemployment benefit went up six and sixpence too. National assistance for the impoverished. The maximum rate was advanced by five shillings for a single person, nine shillings for a married couple. War disability pensioner, maximum disability went up 10 shillings a week. And the same increase for those injured at work. In addition, the family allowance went up from five shillings to eight. Some people seem surprised that such care should be shown by a conservative government for the old and sick and disabled and impoverished. And that's because socialist propaganda has ignored or belittled the conservative record in social and industrial reform. But the conservative first care has always been for those who cannot help themselves. It is expressed in Mr. Eden's words, the strong shall help the weak. What we mean by that is that with only a limited amount to spend, 
the money should be used for those who really need it and not, as under the socialists, used indiscriminately. I don't intend to deliver a lecture, but there are one or two historical facts which ought to be common knowledge. For instance, the appalling factory conditions of the Industrial Revolution, when child labour was employed in the mines and mills, were remedied as the result of agitation by Lord Shaftesbury, the Tory statesman whose name is commemorated in Shaftesbury Avenue and whose memorial is the Eros statue in Piccadilly Circus. Disraeli widened the franchise and gave the country its first public health act. His government legalized the right to strike. Does that surprise anyone? As a matter of fact, trade unions owe their existence to the legislation of conservative governments. See the date on this act, 1925. Widows, orphans, and Old Age Contributory Pensions Act. That was the great pensions legislation, sponsored by Mr. Neville Chamberlain as Minister of Health and the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Mr. Winston Churchill. Incidentally, the Socialists voted against that act. This is the Beveridge Report, 1942, the blueprint of our present social insurance system produced by a committee appointed by the national government. That government adopted it in 1944 as the basis of its plans for the post-war social services. So the present system originated from plans put into motion by Sir Winston Churchill. That is the record, which you can verify by reading your history books. So there is nothing surprising in the Conservative government working now for the welfare, benefit and happiness of all the people. And what has been one of the most triumphant achievements of recent years, but the great housing drive of the Conservative government. This has proved the most important of all the social benefits, because a roof over your head is one of the first essentials of life. And the sight of that target of 300,000 houses a year getting nearer and nearer has been the clearest proof of the difference in outlook between socialists and conservatives between then and now the socialists said it couldn't be done conservatives knew it could be done and the pledge was given by sir winston churchill at the party conference in 1950. You have demanded that the target we should put in our program should be 300,000 houses a year. I accept it as our first priority in time of peace. Oh, yes, I have got a house. The trouble is it's too big for us, and I feel I'm paying more rent than I ought. Children growing up and all that sort of thing, you know. Of course, the council would fine us a house, which suits me and the wife all right, except that it would mean moving out of this neighbourhood. Well, what I want to ask you is if you could get them to find something on the spot for us. You know, something where I don't have to find a new club and we haven't got to walk half a mile to the nearest bus stop. That's what he said. And I had to tell him that he should see his local council and not his member of parliament. Goodbye, Mr Wilson. You understand, I'm sure, it, it wouldn't be right for a member of parliament to try to influence a local housing committee. Uh, go and see your local people. I'm sure you'll find them sympathetic. And now there are many more houses about, your chances are much better of getting a move. Well, thank you very much. And that's where this film started. But you see, he's got so used to things being better that he's become fussy. And mind you, I don't object to that, because I'm all for more freedom of choice and fewer controls to make life more worth living for us all. And though we can all see so much improvement between then and now in conditions, in people's outlook, and in the way other countries look to us again for leadership, we must never give up trying to make things better still. That is the spirit which inspires the Conservative Party.